I'd like to speak a little bit tonight in Yemi Pesach. And the Haggadah says that the Ben Chacham, the wise son, asks a question, what are the various laws that Hashem has commanded with regards to Pesach? So the Haggadah tells us, we should relate to him the laws of the Pesach. That after the Pesach, we do not eat dessert. The question is, of all the halachas of carbon Pesach that we could choose to give as an illustration, why is it just this halacha? That after the uh, eating of the carbon Pesach, we don't eat dessert. So one is tempted to say, because it's the last halacha, it's the halacha that follows the eating of the carbon Pesach. But it really isn't the last halacha. There are halachas as to how you dispose of the nisar. If the carbon is left over to the next morning, you have to burn it. So there are halachas that follow the halacha of not eating dessert after the uh, carbon Pesach. So why is this the halacha which is selected to uh, instruct the, the Ben Chach? Let's put that question on the back burner. I'd like to speak a little bit about some of the halachas of Afikaim. And maybe from the halachas we'll understand a little bit of uh, insight. Now the Gemara Psachim brings the member of Shmuel, the Ein Maftir and Acher Pesach Afikaiman, and likewise Ein Maftir and Acher Hamatz Afikaiman. In the same way that we had a base of Migdash, so the last thing we ate was the Karpen Pesach. So Bizman Mazed, the last thing we eat is the Kazayas Matza, and there's no dessert after that. And we've pointed out many times the uh, very curious thing, that last piece of matzah came to be known as afikaimun. Right, really, afikaimun is the dessert that we don't eat after the matzah. It's not the title we give the matzah itself. But we call it afikaimun. But uh, the lost of the Gemara is, Ein maftir and achar ha afikaimun. In the same way that when we had a base of Migdash and the last thing we ate was the carbon Pesach, there was no dessert after the carbon Pesach. So it was the last thing we eat is matzah, and there's no dessert after the matzah. So the Gemara says that, in fact, this halacha is even more pashat than the halacha, that there's no dessert after the carbon Pesach. Because the idea of this halacha is that the taste should remain in our mouths. So the taste of matzah is very delicate. It's not a very strong taste. So it's pashat. You can't eat after matzah, fruit, or some other dessert, because that will be mavakal, the time of the matzah. But meat has a very strong taste. So one way of thought is permitted. So the Gemara says it's a bigger chidush that after Korban Pesach you can't eat, than after Matzah you can't eat. After Matzah it's really Pasha, you can't. It's a chidush that even after Korban Pesach you can't. But this is the halacha, that uh, you can't eat anything after the final Matzah. The tour brings a shayu. What's the halacha if a person forgot to eat afikaimun and the person already benched? Finished the meal, forgot to eat afikaimun, and benched. So what's the halacha? So the tour says like this. The tour says, Even if you already benched, V'nizkar kaidem shibirach bircha berpirgafen but you remembered before you drank the third kais. So kos of Avi ho Ezri. So the Avi Ezri says, you should wash again, make a mozi, eat the Afi Kaimon, and bench again. Right? If a person benched, but did not yet drink the third kais, wash again, make a mozi, eat the Afi Kaimon, and then bench again, and drink the third kais. But... But let's say he benched and he already drank the third kais. He said, Bar Priya So now there's a complicating factor here. Because if he's going to wash again, make a mozi, eat afikaim and bench again, he'll have to drink an extra kais. And that's near a kamosif alakosas. That look, looks like you're adding to the dalakosas, which you're not allowed to do. So he says, So in that case, you don't eat afikaim again. So, how are you eating 
So he says, Ubichai Gavna. In such a case, Kedai he matzos shalonu lismech aleihem. It's worthwhile to rely on the matzah that you ate during the meal. Kikulom shmurai smeshas lisha. Because it's also matzah shmura. Now the idea is like this that uh, in those days, the common practice was that people ate matzah's mitzvah that they baked there at Pesach. But that was only for the mitzvahs. During the meal, they ate regular matzah. It was shmura, the flour was guarded, but it wasn't baked in Arab Pesach. So really, we would not rely on that matzah for the mitzvah of Afikaim. But if you're going to have a problem of being maisif ala kaisis, if you already benched and drank the third kais, and now if you'd wash again and make a moats, you need afikaim and then bench again, you'd have a problem because you'd have to drink an extra cup of wine. And that's nira ka maisif ala kaisis. So we rely on the matzah you ate during the meal for the afikaim, even though you ate other foods after it. But uh, but the you rely on that for the Afikaim. So in other words, the Balu Iter, excuse me, the Aviyazvi says that if you're going to have a problem of adding to the Kaisas, you could rely on the matzah you ate during the meal as Afikaim, even though it wasn't matzah smith, so it wasn't baked, Arab Pesach, and even though you ate after it, but the you can rely on it for the Afikaim. That's one day he brings. Now, the Prichadash and the Primogadim both speak out that it's clear from the Lashon of the tour that it's only if you ate matzah during the meal. <laughs> what, if, what if you're like all of us on a diet? That you don't eat matzah during the meal. You only eat the matzah for the mitzvahs. But during the meal you eat matzah. Then you're up the creek. It's not an eitzah. Because they speak out. You can rely on the matzah you ate during the meal, and therefore they speak out, even though that's not matzah mitzvah, but it's shmura nevertheless. But it's clear that you have to rely on the matzah you ate during the meal. If you didn't eat matzah during the meal, there's no eitzah. We don't say you ate with the with the matzah that you ate at the beginning of the meal. It has to be matzah you ate during the meal. That's what it comes up from the Aviyazvi. Then he brings another day in. It's not necessary at all. It's not necessary at all to eat after coming a second time, ever. The Yodse Bikazayas Sha'akal Barishaina, your Yodse with the original Kazayas of Matzah that you ate at the beginning of the meal, Athal Pi Sha'akal Dover Akhar Akhrov, even if you ate other foods afterward. And the uh, Akhrainim speak out that according to the Balo Iter, you're not relying on the matzah you ate during the meal, you're relying on the matzah you ate for Motsi Matzah. And that'll be good enough even though you ate foods afterward. So we have a very peculiar Machlaikas. The Aviezvi says that there's a Chiyav Afikai. You can't rely on the matzah you ate for Motsi Matzah. You have to have additional matzah for Afikai. So you have to rely on the matzah you ate during the meal. But the matzah you ate during the meal is problematic, because that wasn't matzah's mitzvah. So what do you do? So we say, if you can conveniently wash again, wash again. If there'll be a problem with myself, all the kaisers, then you rely on that but the evidika matzah. The Balayitra says, no, there's no problem, because you don't have to rely on the matzahs you ate during the meal. You can rely on the matzah you ate for mozi matzah, and that's matzah's mitzvah. And uh, therefore, there's no problem. So there's never a problem. That if you already benched, or even if you washed my machrainim, it's mashma. You can rely on the matzah from Motsi matzah. There's no chiyav afikayim. What's the, what's the shayla? I'd like to point out, uh, the back earlier in, uh, in the simon, speaks out that there's a machlaikas, a very basic, very fundamental machlaikas between the Rambam and the Rosh as to what the Chiyav Afikaiman is. 
Why do we eat afikoyman at the Seder? The Rosh says that the afikoyman that we eat is a zecher for the carbon Pesach. It's to remember the carbon Pesach. And that's why we eat it at the end. Because, you see, when it comes to the mitzvah of matzah, there's a hidur in the mitzvah of matzah that it should be eaten with the oven. It should be eaten with, a, with an appetite. And therefore, it's the first thing we eat. Right, right after we drink the second cup, we wash, we make hamotzi, alachilas matzah, we eat matzah. Because the mitzvah of matzah, there's a hidur in the mitzvah of matzah that it should be eaten with a oven. It should be eaten with an appetite. That's why the Mishnah says that Erev Pesach, you don't eat three hours before nightfall, nor you should have an appetite for the matzah. The mitzvah of matzah is a hidur to eat it with the oven. But by Karpen Pesach, it's the exact opposite. By Karpen Pesach, there's the halacha that karbonais are nechal ala seiva. That karbonais have to be eaten on a full stomach. Why is that? Because to eat karbonas hungrily is not dignified. And when it comes to karbonas, there's a halacha of lemoshcha, which means legedula. You eat it in a noble way. So there's a special halacha in karbonas that is nechal ala seiva. And therefore, the carbon Pesach was eaten last. The matzah was eaten first, and the carbon Pesach was eaten last. Because matzah is eaten with Te'olein, and carbon Pesach is eaten al ha soida. Now, Bizman is there, we have no base Migdash. So we want to make a zecher for carbon Pesach. What's the zecher for carbon Pesach? We eat matzah. So that matzah which you eat, the zecher carbon Pesach, also has to be eaten al ha soida. Just like the carbon Pesach is eaten al ha that matzah has to be eaten al ha so now we have two matzahs that we eat at the Seder. We have the matzah we eat at the beginning, which is for the mitzvah of matzah. There we do it first, because the mitzvah of matzah is to be eaten with an appetite. And we eat matzah at the end, because that's a zecher for the carbon Pesach, which is eaten with a saiva. Now, that halacha, that it has to be eaten with saiva, would not require that it be the last thing be eaten. It wouldn't have to be the absolute last thing eaten. As long as you ate something before it, and you weren't eating on an empty stomach, it would satisfy the requirement of the site. Why is it the last thing? Because there's an additional consideration that we want the taste to remain. So there really are two considerations in Afikaiman. There's a chiyav of Afikaiman to eat Afikaiman with Zecher Karpen Pesach, and in order that it be an appropriate zeichel the carbon pasach, it has to be eaten a la saiva. It has to be eaten not on an empty stomach, <clears throat> full stomach. But that would not require that it be eaten last. Now there's an additional halach that you want the taste to remain in your mouth. So therefore, we eat the carbon pasach not in the middle of the meal, but after the last thing. That's the sheet of the, the rush. But if you look in the Rambam, the Rambam makes no mention of the fact that Afikaimon is a zecher for carbon Pesach. No such thing. He writes the following. V'yachar kach, nimshach besuda, you have the meal. The oichol kamashu writes a lechol, the shalosu kamashu writes lishtais. You have the meal, you eat whatever you want. Meat, chicken, vegetables, so on and so forth. Ubach reina, in the end, oichol me besara pesach afilu kezayis, you eat a kezayis, ve'enu toyem akro of klau. Ubezman hazeh, oichol kezayis matzah, ve'enu toyem akro behal klum. When we had the carbon Pesach, you ate the kezayis of Pesach at the end, and you eat nothing afterward. And b'zman azeh, you eat the kezayis of matzah, and eat nothing afterward. Why? Kidei shi'iyya hafsek su'udoso, in order that the end of the meal should be the tambosar of Pesach, by a matzah b'piv, you should have the taste of the Pesach or the matzah in your mouth, shachilos niya mitzvah, because that is the mitzvah. And there's no mention of the fact that the reason you eat the matzah last is because it's a zecher for carbon Pesach. So the Bach is medayek, that the Rambam understands 
that the last matzah is not a zechel of carbon pesach. And in fact, the Rambam shita is, if you look carefully in the Rambam, the Rambam writes that you eat matzah and maror and carbon pesach in the beginning of the meal. The Rambam doesn't pass in the carbon pesach is nachal al soiva. The Rambam asked why that is. And you eat pesach again at the end, and matzah again at the end, even though you ate it already. The whole halacha to eat a kezayis, either of Pesach or matzah at the end, is for the taste to be in your mouth. There's no halacha that Pesach has to be nachal ala soiva, and there's no halacha that matzah has to be nachal ala soiva, because it's a zeche for carbon Pesach. The whole halacha of eating at the end of the meal, either a kezayis of Pesach or a kezayis of matzah, is only for the taste to be in your mouth. That means really you are Yotze the Chi of Matzah entirely with the Gezayas at the beginning. Mm -hmm. You're Yotze the Chi of Karpen Pesach with the Gezayas at the beginning. In order that you should have the taste in your mouth, there's a Chi of to eat Matzah and or Pesach at the end. That's the sheet of the round. And the back is Mafalbo in this. It comes out like this. That the Avi Ezri clearly goes like the sheet of the rush. Then with Avi Ezri says a Pashat to thing. He says that there's a chi of Afi Kaiman. You have to eat matzah al hasoiva, just like you have to eat carbon pesach al hasoiva. So even if the Yevid you benched, you can't rely on the matzah you ate from Motsi matzah. That wasn't eaten al hasoiva. How can you rely on that matzah? So you have to eat matzah again. But with the Yevad, you could rely on the matzah that was eaten in the middle of the meal. Because the matzah in the middle of the meal was eaten ala soiva. It wasn't the last thing. But it was eaten ala soiva. So therefore the best thing is to eat matzah the last thing. Boy, you can't do that. Let's say you benched and drank the third kaiser already. So now you have a problem with mice of other kaisers. You can rely on the matzah you ate in the middle of the meal. Not on the matzah you ate at the beginning of the meal. Because the matzah you ate at the beginning of the meal was lite avayim. And in order for the matzah to be a zeich of the carbon pesach, it has to be l'saiva. So you can't rely on the matzah you ate at the beginning of the meal, but you can rely on the matzah you ate in the middle of the meal. And that's what Avi Ezri says. And that's what the Achorinim say, according to the Avi Ezri. That you have to know you ate matzah during the meal. If you're on a diet and there's no matzah during the meal, this eight isn't an eight. You can't rely on the matzah you ate in the beginning. Because the matzah that you eat, the final matzah, has to be a zeichel le carbon pesach. To be a zeichel le carbon pesach, it has to be ala soiva. And the first matzah you ate from motzi matzah wasn't ala soiva, it was le So you can't rely on that matzah. You have the additional matzah. So if you ate matzah during the meal, but the other, you can rely on that. It's not lechatchila, because lechatchila should be the last thing that the taste should be on your mouth. But but yeah, but you're yo to the chi of Afi Kaiman with the matzah you ate in the middle of the meal, and okay, so the problem of taste. Here there's no eitzah, because you already drank the third kais. The Balo Iter holds like the Rambam. And the Balo Iter holds that there is no chiv to eat matzah ala soiva. The chi of matzah is with teovin in the beginning. But there's a halacha, you won't have the taste of matzah on your mouth. So therefore, that's what we do. We eat matzah again, so the taste should be in our mouth. But but yeah, we've already benched. So we say, your yaitza with the kezayas matzah you ate in the beginning. I it wasn't ala soiva, malka wasn't ala soiva. There's no chiyot to eat matzah ala soiva. The matzah isn't the zecher for carbon pesach. Right? You eat matzah only that you should have the taste of matzah. So that halach is only lechat chila, but the yeah, if you're already benched. So... Good enough to rely on the matzah you ate at the beginning of the seder. That's the the mm. like this. So it's a fantastic mach like this. Mm. It's an amazing, amazing mach like this. It comes out that according to the rush, there's two halachas here. There's a chi of tid afi kaiman, and that is to eat al hasoiva, and there's a chi of to eat matzah at the end. They should have the taste, and you can have one without the other. Because you can rely in certain instances on the matzah you ate in the middle of the meal, which is al-hasayva, even though you ate afterward.
Right? Well, you can't eat after Kaimut again because you already drank the third Kais. So you'll have this situation where you're Yaitza Afi Kaimun with the matzah you ate in the middle of the meal, even though you ate other foods afterward. But it has to be the matzah in the middle of the meal. It has to be Allah Saiba. And according to the Ram Darno Dinim, there is no chi of eat matzah, Zeich Makar and Pesach. The whole matzah is only to have the taste of matzah in your mouth. And if we dispense with that Bidiyevit, then you just go back and rely on the matzah you ate from Moti Matzah. That's good enough. I want to point out that maybe there's another map like this Vishayim, which is the Rambam and the Rosh Lushi Tosam. The Beis Yosef brings a curious machlaikis in tough iron bays several semana before, whether Afi Kaiman requires Haseba. The Allah is when you eat the matzah, the Gemara says, matzah boy Haseba. So the Rambam says that applies to the matzah you eat from Motzi Matzah. The matzah you eat from Afi Kaiman does not require Haseba. That's the sheet of the Rambam. And the Rosh argues, the Rosh says, Befeirish, that the matzah of the Afi Kaiman requires Haseba. That's the Shachanach Pass, the Shachanach is Machmir. But the Beis brings them up like this. Rambam and the Rosh in this halach. And at first glance, it isn't, it isn't understood exactly what the, the issue is. The issue was like this. The Chacham were mistaken that when we perform the mitzvahs of the night, matzah, dal of kaisas, we should perform them b'haseva, we should perform them reclining. That's the halacha that the Chazal were mistaken. So as the Rosh says, after Kremlin is also a mitzvah. The matzah of Motzi matzah, that's for the mitzvah of the rice of Achilles matzah. The matzah of Afikaimon is for the mitzvah of Zeich Lekar and Pasach. So it's also a mitzvah. So the halach is, any achila, any eating you do that night for a mitzvah, except for the maru, of course, which is a zeich for the bitterness, but any mitzvah you perform that night requires haseva. So therefore, the matzah requires haseva, and the Afikaimon requires haseva, the dalakaisas require haseva, as we would expect. But the Rambam Lashitasa holds that Afi Kaiman really isn't a mitzvah. You don't mitzvah Afi Kaiman. It says, you want that the taste of the original matzah should be restored. So therefore you eat matzah again. But it's not because Afi Kaiman is a mitzvah. It's so that the taste of the original matzah should be restored. Right? You ate matzah at the beginning of the Seder. But in the meantime, you had chicken soup, you had gefilte fish, you had everything else. So you want to restore the taste of that matzah so that there should be a hefsek sud, the sud should end it with the taste of matzah. So you eat matzah again to restore the taste. But it's not a mitzvah per se. Never the Rambam says it doesn't require a seba. Abu is the, the sheet. Let's go back to the Ben Chacham. The Ben Chacham comes to his father and says, What are the various laws, the Eidais, the Chukim, and Mishpatim, which Hashem has commanded you? So the author of the God tells us, answer the question, and tell him, All the Lachas of Pesach, Imach Tirnach of Pesach, Happy Kaiman. If you look in the Chumash, the Chumash just gives a different answer to the Ben Chacham. The Chumash says, the you tell the Ben Chacham, Avodim Hayinu the Pharaoh of Mitzrayim, they were slaves to Paro, and Hashem took us out, Hotzi Misham, and he took us out from there to give us the gift of Eretz Yisrael, and they gave us these mitzvahs for our own good, and so on and so forth. The idea is that the Torah is telling us that in addition to answering his question, telling him what the laws are, you should also give him a hakdama, give him an introduction, and give him the background to the mitzvahs. Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim, and he brought us to Eretz Yisrael, he gave us the Torah for our own good, and so on and so forth. And then, after you've laid down the foundations, then go on and explain the details of the mitzvahs. In those psukim, in those psukim, which the father tells the Ben Chacham, one of the psukim is a pasuk that we mentioned later in the Seder. One of the psukim is, Hashem took us out of there, 
Lasses Lunel to give us the land that he promised to our forefathers. Now that pasuk has a special poignance. Because if you go ahead really to the end of Magid, so it says there that Bukhol Darvadar in every generation, Chayab Odom Liros as Asmoki Iluhu Yatami Mitzray. A person is obligated to see himself as if he left Mitzrayim. And it goes on to say, Not only did he redeem our forefathers, He redeemed us as well. And it brings this pasuk, He took us out, To bring us, To give us, The land that he swore to our forefathers. In other words, this pasuk, which is told to the Ben Chacham, emphasizes the fact that the Yetzias Mitzrayim is not merely something which the father experienced, it is something that took place for the benefit of the son as well. It wasn't just that God took me out, God took us out. Which means this, that in this Hakdama, in this introduction, that the father is making to the son, he's not really giving him a historical background. Yeah, we were slaves, and Hashem took us out, we go to Star Sinai. The father is also alluding to the fact that everything that the Kaddish Baruch Hu did in Mitzrayim, he did not do only for the Jews of Mitzrayim. He did for all the later generations as well. Let's understand this. I think the, the, the Havana is very partial. Let's say I do you a favor. I give you something. I give you a large sum of money. You know, that sum of money you may invest, and it may be passed down to your heirs, and ultimately to your grandchildren, and to your great-grandchildren. But you wouldn't say that I did this favor for your great-grandchildren. I couldn't know that you're going to have great-grandchildren, I certainly didn't have them in mind, because what I did, I did for you. Your grandchildren are beneficiaries of the fact, but unintended beneficiaries. I, I didn't do it for them. I, I couldn't do it for them. How would I know? How would I know who they are, what they are, are they going to be? How would I know that I would want to do them a favor? It was, whatever I do, I do for you. If it happens to be that a uh, hundred years down the road, we see that your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren benefit from that, that is certainly something which is unintended. It's not what I had in mind. But by Akadosh Baruch Hu, there is no such thing as an unintended consequence. If Akadosh Baruch Hu does something for you, he foresees how this will impact your children, and he foresees how it will impact your grandchildren, and he foresees how it will impact your great-grandchildren, and therefore when Akadosh Baruch Hu did it to you, or did it for you, he had you in mind, and your children in mind, and your grandchildren in mind, and your great-grandchildren, at so called diaries. And it was well intended. And that is what the father tells his son. The father tells his son, yes, I was in Mitzrayim, and Hashem took me out, and he brought me to Hasina and gave me the Torah, but you should know, O son who holds me, Shem, he took all of us out. It's not that he did this for me, and you are the unintended consequence, the unintended beneficiary. When a Baruch Hu does something for one generation, it is with the conscious intent to benefit the next generation, and the next generation, and the next generation, and therefore in reality, it wasn't that he took me out of Mitzrayim, oh, son of Otsinisham, he took us out of Mitzrayim. Because it was done not only for the people that were there, it was done for their children, and their children's children, and their children's children's children. Now, human beings can't always do that. Sometimes they can. I think I mentioned one time we wrote the very, very beautiful story of Rabbi Shlomo Haiman Zechat Sadak Lebrach, the Rashiv of Tervedas, that uh, the story is told that on one snowy day he came to give shear, and instead of having the uh, hundreds of Talmidim that normally were there, there were only four people that came, only four people that braved the snow to show up. But he gave the shear with the same enthusiasm as if he was speaking to a pack based member. So one of the bottoms said, Rabbi, there's no one here. What's the, what's the point? So he said, you think I'm speaking to you? I'm speaking to you and to your children and to your grandchildren and to your great-grandchildren. And that justifies speaking with all the energy and all the drive because this is something which is nitzchi. This is something which is eternal. 
But uh, maybe G'dayli Yisrael can have that type of vision. But as a rule, it's not the case. As a rule, we do something for someone, we have that person in mind. We're not thinking of his children, grandchildren, great grandchildren. And part of the Rebona is certainly not that way. The Rebona Shalom certainly has everything in mind, therefore it's true. When he took the Jews out of Mitzrayim, he had their children in mind, so the father is justified in telling the child later on, Osonu Hotsi Misha. Now this is an important thing. This means that through the instruction of the father, a link to the past can be established. Meaning this child who never saw himself as the beneficiary of the Yisias Mitzrayim, he never saw this as something which was relevant to him, the father instructs him and informs him and now comes to understand that he is connected to a historical event that predated his own birth. And now he has a connection to an event, a direct connection to an event to which he never thought he had a connection. So his relationship to the CS Messiah is very different than the father's. The father who was there, it's just, it carries forward. He remembers it, he recalls it, he still feels it in his bones. There was no interruption, no hefsick. In the case of the child, from this point onward there's a continuity. But it's a link which is established through the father's instruction. Through the father telling the child, O son of Hotsi Misham, now the child becomes connected to this event that predated his birth. And now, from this point onward, he savors the memory and he recollects and he remains attached to that historic event. That is just like the Afi Kaiman according to the Rambam Shita. Because according to the Rambam Shita, the taste that we're meant to have in our mouths is not the taste of the Afi Kaiman. According to the Rosh, it's the taste of the Afi Kaiman. We eat the Afi Kaiman as a Zech for the Karp of Pesach. And it's the taste of the Afi Kaiman that we want to be sustained. According to the Rambam, it's not the taste of the Afi Kaiman. There's no mitzvah of the Afi Kaiman. It's the taste of the original matzah we ate at the beginning of the Seder we want to be sustained. But how are we going to sustain that? There's been a lot in between. We've had the fish, and we've had the soup, and we've had the meat, and we've had all those things. But you can eat a piece of matzah afterward, and it restores the taste of the original matzah. So there's now a continuity, there's a hemshech of the original matzah, which has been restored through the eating of the matzah at the end of the Seder. It's not that matzah that we want to continue. It's the original matzah we want to continue. But by eating the second matzah, we restore the taste of the first matzah. And that's, we explained it according to the Rambam. That's what the second matzah be'etzim doesn't require us to that, that matzah which we eat at the end of the Seder really is not a matzah of mitzvah at all. It's only the restoration of the taste of the original matzah that we ate at the beginning of the Seder. But that's the halacha that the father alludes to when he speaks to the son. That that aim of you and after a Pesach Afi Kaiman, in other words, that kezayis of Pesach is to restore the taste of the Pesach we ate at the beginning of the Suda. This manazet it's matzah. This matzah we eat is to restore the taste of the matzah at the beginning of the Suda, meaning that a connection can be re-established. It doesn't have to be something which is uninterrupted. There can be a long hefsek, a long interruption of time, and you can restore the connection by what you do afterward. If you eat matzah now, then the taste of the original matzah is considered as having continued. If you eat Pesach now, it's considered as if the taste of the original Pesach has continued. And that's something which is tremendously important for this child to know. Because this child sees himself as being disconnected from Yitzhak Mitzrayim. He's the next generation. He wasn't born in Mitzrayim. He was born in freedom. He doesn't see a connection to that. The father tells him, no, O son of Hotsi Misham, listen carefully. Hashem took us out. And through the father's instruction, the child becomes connected to an event which he never thought he had any connection to. But now, once that connection is established, now he savors the taste of the original redemption forever. That really is the remez in this halacha of Eim of Tirnaka Pesach According to the Sheet of the Rambam, it, 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 it comes out with a great poignance 
That is the halakh that we want to point out. This is a comment and refer to something that we said many, many years ago. It may be as much as 18 or 19 years ago. Just on the, on the Haggadah, we mentioned Bukhol Dar Vidar, there's a question as to what the correct nusach of the Haggadi here is. But the version we have is that there are two halachas, and each of which is followed by a supporting verse. First we say, Bechol dor v'dor in every generation, Chayav Adam Liros as Aftamak Ilu Yatam Mitzrayim. A person has to see himself as if he left Egypt. Shinemar, as is written, you shall tell your son, I eat the matzah and more because what God did for me. And the assumption is that this pasuk is not only said by people that left Mitzrayim, even by their descendants, that they also have to see themselves as if they themselves left Mitzrayim. So we have a halacha and a supporting verse. Then we have another statement. Not only was our, were our forefathers redeemed, we also were redeemed. Shinamar, as it says, God took us out to bring us to the land which he swore to our forefathers. So we have a second statement. Not only our forefathers, we also were redeemed, and a supporting verse for that. So anyone who's sensitive to the subtleties of Chazal understands that if we bring two statements and a supporting verse for each, we're talking about two different halachas. First, there's a halacha of Bukhol Dor Vador, and the proof to that is from the Pasuk of Babur Zel Asa Hashem Li. Now there's a second halacha, Loa Sanusein Lubovad, and the supporting verse for that is Velasan Uhotzi Misha. Now the interesting difference between the two verses is that in the first verse, the father is speaking to the son, but he doesn't include the son. The morale makes this observation. He says, This is what Hashem did for me. Now, we know from earlier in the Seder, one of the reasons for that is because it's the father speaking to the Ben Rasha, who has excluded himself. So he says, leave a low, low. But in any case, that Pasuk does not include the son. The father is speaking, Hashem took me out. The son isn't included. In the second verse, O son of Hotzimisham, there the father is speaking to the son and makes the argument that God did it for both of us. So how do you account for this difference? When the son, when the father speaks to the son, is he telling the son it happened to me, and the father does not include the son, or is the father telling the son it happened to us, because the father is including the son? How do you understand these two halachas and two very different psukim? So we explain that in this halacha of seeing yourself in every generation as having left Mitzrayim, it really entails two different things. The second is what we explained previously. The understanding that when Akadosh Baruch Hu does a miracle for one generation, it's not that the benefits to future generations are unintended. On the part of Akadosh Baruch Hu, it's always intended. Akadosh Baruch Hu knows what the consequences will be. If he does it for the fathers, he's doing it for the children. That's the second halacha. Lois Hussein Lubovat, it's not only our forefathers, Afosano Galimum, he redeemed us, as it says, Osano Hotsi Misham. That's a, a statement of fact. It's a statement of fact that, that we are the beneficiaries of the Asiyah's Mitzrayim. Right? Hashem did it not just for the Jews of that time, He did it for us. He had us in mind. A hundred generations later, He knew we'd be born. He had us in mind. We are part of the justification for the Asiyah's Mitzrayim. There's another halacha, which is this. Even if we are the beneficiaries of the Asiyah's Mitzrayim, we are the beneficiaries of an event which happened 3,300 years ago. But it's not enough to feel that I have benefited from the Yesias Mitzrayim. I have to experience the Yesias Mitzrayim. I have to witness the Yesias Mitzrayim. Because we know that one of the benefits of the Yesias Mitzrayim is not the mere fact that it's free. It's the witnessing of the miracles, which is the basis of our Amunah. As Ramban explains, that all our basic beliefs are affirmed <coughs> by the miracles of the Yesias Mitzrayim. We have to envision ourselves as if we beheld those miracles. How do we do that? 
That is a mitzvah for which we need to use the powers of imagination. For the f- other halacha, was son of Hotzi Misham, it's not a question of imagination. It's just a statement of uh, fact. That if a good brother did a miracle for our great, great, great grandfathers, we are the intended beneficiaries of that miracle too. Oh, son of Hotzi Misham. That's a fact. But to actually see ourselves as if we were there, to envision the dam, the tzvardaya, the kingdom, the makas b'chayrus, the kriyas yamsuf, that already requires imagination. And that is also part of the obligation of the Seder night. In every generation, a person has to see himself as if he left Mitzrayim. The Rambam adds the words, ki lu Mitzrayim ato, as if he left Mitzrayim now. That means on the Seder night, he has to imagine himself not as having experienced it five years ago, or ten years ago, or even last week. He has to envision himself as experiencing it now. That's already an exercise of imagination. That you have to use your creativity to envision such a thing. And that is something that by definition cannot be a shared experience. I can teach you something, but I can't dream something with you. I can't imagine something with you. I can only tell you that I am envisioning it in the hope that you might be inspired to use your imagination to do the same. And therefore, when we speak about that, the Father speaks about Himself. This is what Hashem did for me when I went out of Mitzrayim. I see myself going out now. The Father can't share that with the Son. The Father cannot bring the Son into His vision, into His dreams, into His imagination, into His fantasy world. But the Son can be inspired to do the same. So if the Son sees the Father is doing it, hopefully the Son will also do it. But that's why that pasuk of Babur Zeosu Hashem Li is the father speaking and not including the son. You can include the son when you speak about the political fact that his freedom and our freedom were intended consequences of the same actions in Mitzrayim. But if you're talking about using imagination to envision the makos and the miracles, that's something which by definition can't be shared. Every person has to do that for himself, and therefore that's the father speaking, also Hashem Li, Hashem did for me, Hopefully the son will emulate the father, but it's not something which the father can bring the son into. But upon him it comes out that really the Seder night there are two distinct obligations. One obligation is, is to be grateful. We have to recognize that uh, this was intended. Our freedom, whatever we enjoy, was an intended consequence of the Yitzhiyah's Messiah. You know, often we lack a courage to talk, we lack gratitude, because we tell ourselves that the person who bestowed the favor upon us didn't have us in mind. Now, are we grateful to our parents for having given birth to us? We uh, tell ourselves that our parents uh, stumbled into it. They had no idea <laughs> that we would be the consequence of their action. So uh, we're not told with tremendous gratitude. But the reality is that uh, on the part of the Rebunish Lailam, that's not the case. Everything he does, he knows exactly what the consequences are. If he did it, the consequences were intended. So we have to be filled with tremendous gratitude. That has to be the, I think, the first aspect of the night. That whatever we have, the fact that we are Jews, the fact that we are Jews in a safe, secure place, right, is ultimately a consequence of the Yitzhiyah's Mitzrayim. As Dagada says, the evil of Hotzi HaKadosh was have a same in Mitzrayim. If Hashem would not have taken us out of Mitzrayim, we would still be enslaved to power of the Mitzrayim. That means whatever we enjoy, it might be hard to trace a straight line from the Yitzhiyah's Mitzrayim to our current situation. But as a matter of faith, we believe that if the Yitzhiyah's Mitzrayim would not have taken place, history essentially would have ended, and we would be enslaved to Paro and Mitzrayim, we'd be working on the pyramids today. There would have been no progress, no development, nothing would have changed, everything would be exactly the same. I know it's hard to imagine because the world moves so fast nowadays, but keep in mind that 3,000 years ago, things did not move so fast. If you compare what things were like 3,000 years ago to 2,500 years ago to 2,000 years ago, there's not much difference. Things moved much more slowly. Nowadays, in five years, there's a whole uh, in the world, technology. But in those days, change was very, 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 very slow. And all that change is ultimately to advance God's plan for Kalal Yisrael. But if 
God's plan for Klai so would have been aborted at the early stage because there wouldn't have been a CS Messiah and the history would have continued at the same slow pace as it did for hundreds and hundreds of years and there would have been no progress over the last 2000 and we would still be slaves to power of Messiah building pyramids working in the hot desert sun whipped by taskmasters in the old fashioned way. So therefore, if we are living in a modern world in Canada and we're enjoying the benefits of modern technology and society and freedom, that is a consequence of the CS Mitzrayim. And it's not an unintended consequence, it was an intended consequence. And that's Osana Hotsi Mishal. So it's a night for Akara Satov. And that's why the morale says in the Haggadah that there's a lock of Kolomarba, the Sapper, be a CS Mitzrayim, the Reza Meshubach. That if a person relates the story abundantly, he's praiseworthy. Why is it called a mar b'zerim mashabuch? So the morale says beautifully. Normally, there's a halacha of la elam yeshana adal la tamiru derech tsar. When you teach a student, you should always be as concise as possible. You know, don't uh, be overly verbose. Just say it straightforward, concisely. That's true. To convey information, you do it in this brief away as possible. If you convey an idea in 10 words, don't use 15. But when you express gratitude, then you have to be lavish. You have to be lengthy. Right? You don't say, well, if I can express my gratitude in two words, why should I do it in a thousand words? <laughs> the opposite. Even though you could do it in two words, you should do it in a thousand words. Otherwise, you're an ingrate. And therefore, that's the first aspect of the Seder night. That corresponds to the Osonu Hotsi Misho. We have to understand that we are the beneficiaries of the Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. And think about it. If the statement of the Haggadah is true, that if not for the Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, we'd still be there, then obviously everything we enjoy in life is a consequence of the Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. You have a nice car, you have a nice house, you live in a nice country, your kids go to nice schools, you have nice clothes to wear. It's all a consequence of the Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. If the Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim wouldn't have happened, we would have none of that. And that was intended. Osana Hotsi Misham. God had in mind the children of the Yotzi Mitzrayim and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren and their great-great-great-great-grandchildren at Ayayim So that's the first thing, which is a Karasa type. But the second thing is we have to have a little bit of vision. Because faith is very, very, very difficult. It needs constant reinforcement. And uh, we all would like to see miracles. If we would see miracles, we tell ourselves we would have much more Yerashimayim, we'd have much more Bitochan, more confidence, because we'd see things with our own eyes. Unfortunately, we don't see these things with our own eyes. That's where imagination comes in. Right? You, we all believe that it's true. We have a Torah that tells it. We all believe Torah is in Hashemayim, but it doesn't impact us because we don't use the the power of imagination to envision the events that you see as if they really actually happen. So it's time to close your eyes a little bit. Don't fall asleep, of course, but close your eyes and think about what it will be like to have been there. What it will be like to have witnessed the Dam, the Sredei, and the Kinem, and the Makas Bukharis, and the Kriya Siamsev. And if you can envision it, so then it becomes real, it becomes more powerful. It serves as a basis for faith, it serves as a basis for bitachon, for trust. It serves as a basis for Yir Hashemayim. Right? We'll, we'll have a bit of a pachat. And I once uh, heard that, uh, Victor Miller once told someone, he says, if you want to imagine Gehenna, next time you're standing by the stove and the flame is on the burner, imagine yourself sitting in there. <laughs> right? It sounds funny, but these types of tziur, these types of images, can be very, very powerful in impressing a, a truth upon ourselves. And that's true with the experiences of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. If we think about them, we reflect upon them, if we use our imagination, then these will be so powerful that they will move us, they will inspire us in ways that we otherwise wouldn't be inspired. That's the first half. The chay of Odom Liras as Atla, Kilu Yatsim Mitzrayim, as the Rambam says Atla, you have to see yourself as if you're leaving Mitzrayim now, and this is a night not only for expressing gratitude, it's a night for his chaskos, for strengthening oneself in amuna and faith and bitach and the trust in Yer HaShemayim, in reverence for the Rebbe HaShemayim. And hopefully all those things will come together in the Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. 
And even, again, even if there are people at your Seder who are new, who are new recruits to Jewish observance, or maybe uh, on the verge of conversion, not even Jewish yet, and they're there, and you wonder, like, what meaning can this have to them? There's no chain of tradition. There's no, there's no taste which lingers in their mouth from last year and the year before and the generation before and the generation before that. So that's the Rambam Shita of Eim Avtir Nacha Pesach Afikayman. That what we want to accomplish with the Afikayman is not to eat the Afikayman and have the taste of the Afikayman last. The Afikayman is an artificial means of stretching out the taste of the original matzah that we ate at the beginning of the Seder. That means we can establish a continuity even after a break. So that's the hope for the Seder. There's our hope for all the Rechaikim that come to our Seder, all those people that are spiritually hungry, that are spiritually needy, all those who are hungry, let them come and eat, all those in need, not only people that are physically hungry, people that are spiritually hungry, people who are severed from their connection. Our hope is that we can reestablish that connection. We can connect them to things that they have no contact with already for decades, and maybe even for generations, Rahman al We can reconnect them to the point that the town, the taste, which is the taste of the originally of C.S. Mitzrayim, will be fresh on their lips for years to come that a, a, a new connection can be reestablished through the observance of the Seder. That's what our hope is. That's the Ram Rashita in, in this halacha of Eim Avti Nachar Pesach Afi So it's a night of tremendous promise. And the Baruch Hashem Shkibu told the Seat Dishmaya that the, that the Seder should achieve all it's meant to achieve, and hopefully it will be a good start in our preparations for beyond the Yemei HaOimer and preparing for, for Shavuos, I saw, wrote down, the Kozhmet Sermagid says an amazing thing. He says, we know the shame of Hashem, the shame Adnus, is Aleph, Dalet, Nun, Yud. So he says like this, he says that Yud refers to the first ten days of Nisan. That's the Yud, the first ten days of Nisan, Aleph through Yud. Dalet refers to the next four days, working backwards. You'd Aleph, you'd Beis, you'd Gimel, you'd Dalet. Until the era of Pesach. Nun refers to the 50 days from the first day of Pesach through era of Shavuos. You think about it, because the Oymer is 49 days, starting from the second day of Pesach. So it's really 50 days starting from the first day of Pesach. And then Aleph is, of course, the day of Shavuos. Right? That uh, this whole period from Rosh Chodesh Nisan until Shavuos is an opportunity for being Makabal, for accepting upon ourselves the oil, the, the yoke of Hashem being our master, Aleph, Dalet, Nun, Yud, starting from Rosh Chodesh Nisan, which of course was t- today, going to Shavuos. It's one Hemshech, so hopefully we'll be Matzliach, beginning with uh, our preparations for Pesach, and hopefully going to the Stardom, and Pesach, the Yemei Oimer, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, to re-envision ourselves standing on our Sinai and the Bizeich to that Aleph, which is the, uh, the Kabbalah's old Torah, which we hope to see at the end of this entire wonderful Tkufa.